I want to start off by just asking a quick question. Does anybody in this room want to live forever? Okay, good. I don't think that's possible, but I, but I do think that allowing us to maintain a quality and a dignity in our lives well into our 90s uh, is literally at our fingertips today. And I, I want to spend this, uh, this few minutes with you talking about some of the things we're doing uh, to pursue this. Digital health is one of the tool sets that is being brought to bear to help us better understand, interrogate, and define ways to address the problems associated with aging. And, and fundamentally what aging is, it's an, it's an accumulation of defects that occur to your biology that lead to things like decayed joints and decreased muscle mass and so on. Myself and a couple of my, uh, my good friends and colleagues, Craig Venter and Peter Diamandis, decided that the time was now to utilize the cutting edge technologies that are available in the fields of genomics, metabolomics, proteomics, microbiomics, and apply a very powerful lens so that we could identify actionable targets that would allow us to preserve the physiologic functions that are associated with youth. So I spent the last, uh, the last 15, 20 years of my life in the field of cellular medicine. I make a joke that when the company that acquired the company I founded uh, in stem cells created a division called Cellular Therapeutics, uh, for the first few months, some of my colleagues would actually call up and they thought I was the guy who was in charge of getting them an iPhone. So, so, <laughs> cel cel so cellular has that kind of uh, interesting set of connotations. But, but during the last 15 years in working to productize and reduce to a clinical deliverable living cells as a therapeutic, basically pharmaceuticalizing cells, uh, I began to realize that many of the mechanisms responsible for taking a cell from its primordial form to a mature, specialized, highly effective and efficient form paralleled many of the processes that occurred in aging. And so I think there's a connection between stem cells and longevity, and perhaps re residing within this is the fountain of youth. I spent um, the, the early part of my professional medical career as a surgeon. My specialty was, was head and spinal cord injury. And as a surgeon, I found myself quite often um, taking observations from the bedside to the bench in an attempt to find a solution and then reducing those solutions back to a tool which I could apply to patients. What's illustrated here is that a simple observation, at, at one time we had a patient who had a large defect in the, in the, the tissue covering uh, that surrounds the brain. And in order to find a proper replacement, it dawned on me that from my OBGYN rotations that there was this remarkable tissue called the amnion, which was basically this beautiful, clear, plastic-like tissue that seemed very much like the tissue we had to replace. And I began to pay attention uh, to that material, the leftovers of birth, the placenta. And from that, I built a company where we explored the placenta as a, as a source of stem cells. All of us have heard the term stem cell, and I don't mean to, to reduce this to, the, to a simplistic explanation, but what, what makes the stem cell unique is its ability to mature into any specialized cell type of the body. It also ca has the capability of reproducing itself in a format that in essence maintains a reservoir which can be called upon at any time to participate in the processes of renovation or repair that take place in the body. Remarkable, remarkable um, biological toolkit that resides in all of us. Now, I, I've learned in the last 15 years that regardless of where you can get stem cells, and you can get them from lots of places, you can find them in the placenta, you can find them in bone marrow, you can find them in adipose tissue, every stem cell thinks that it's still in a fetus. And what I mean by that, the behaviors of that cell the activities of that cell, I believe, are aimed at driving the overall system, the overall ph physiologic system, back to a state of what's almost infinite repair. If any of you have heard of, of something called fetal surgery, it is the ability to actually open up the uterus early in gestation, take the fetus out, perform a surgical procedure, place it back in and allow gestation to be completed. And what's remarkable is that this is scarless surgery. When the, when the infant is born, you don't see any remnants of that surgical procedure. 
So that state, that early state in development, is associated with a very, very high capability to repair and renew. And so what's fueling this regenerative engine, as I've, as I've termed it, um, are the stem cells that are resident in the tissue. In utero, these cells reside in the placenta. Later in life, they reside in all of your organs and tissues. Uh, most notably, they reside in your bone marrow. And, and these cells drive the natural process of renovation and repair that occurs in all of us. And it's what keeps us healthy while we're young. And as that regenerative engine starts to lose its fuel supply, we begin to accumulate deficits and defects as we age. What's also important is that these cells help orchestrate the response to injury. And so they are perhaps our best defense against disease. And what I've learned in the last several years is that remarkably, these cells are the, the uh, repository of the synthetic repertoire. And what I mean by that is that every cell, every cell contains information in the form of DNA, which is used to code for the synthesis and production of molecules which, which are responsible for the signaling and the synthesis and production of all of our tissues and organs. This takes place from a primordial stem cell, which then differentiates, which means that it undergoes a series of cell divisions along a path to the specialized mature form or phenotype. And along that way, the cell changes. We can actually look under a microscope and see that those changes are very, very evident. A neuron looks very different from a primordial stem cell. A cardiac muscle cell looks very, very different from a neuron. So that process of specialization is associated with dramatic changes to form and function. I believe is that differentiation, this process of leading to specialized cells, is aimed at creating a high degree of synthetic efficiency. So as I mentioned before, resident in all of our cells in the nucleus is our biological sof software in the form of DNA. That DNA in a stem cell maintains access to the entire transcribable genome, which means that any, any part of that code can be read and converted into a product, such as a protein. But as these cells are, are called upon to become neurons or heart cells or liver cells, they no longer need to do all that. It's just like having a software program. If you have the whole Microsoft Office package, but all you ever use is Word, you don't call upon those other, those other elements of code. That same thing takes place in our cells, and it takes place during the process of differentiation. And it occurs because we actively have a process of gene silencing, which takes place, which reduces the versatility of cells, increases their efficiency, and results in a restriction of the proteome or the synthetic products, the protein products that are made by those cells. So what this really means is that stem cell differentiation echoes much of the processes that we see in aging. And if you think about this, this illustration of the way an individual will morph from youth to an elderly state, I believe that this, this is a process which is defined by a reduction in the number of undifferentiated stem cells which reside in each tissue compartment and an increase, a relative increase, in the differentiated specialized cell mass. And at some point, at some point, some, some important barrier is crossed where we lose, we lose some of that adaptability and versatility that's necessary to renovate us back to a state of youthfulness. So does that mean, does that mean that maybe an easy solution to aging is to simply replenish that, that reservoir of stem cells that gives you that versatility? Well, I think, it's, I think it is possible, and I think it's possible because, as I mentioned before, this, this series of events which lead to the specialized mature form are changes, fundamental changes to the way our DNA um, is packaged and there's, there is some groundbreaking Nobel Prize quality research which has shown that you can actually take a mature cell that's had some of this DNA packaging to make a cell specialized, reversible, so that a cell can become what's called an induced pluripotent stem cell, meaning that you regain some of that versatility that you need. Um, 
And this all, to me, points to the fact that if I have cells that have access to that full transcribable genome and I can simply put them back into patients and replenish that reservoir, that might be a key to restoring youthfulness to an individual. And so protein diversity, which is necessary because every protein has a function. In many cases, proteins act in a, in a redundant way to provide different types of functions in the same category of activity. A best example of this are collagens, which are structural proteins, each one a little bit different, each one having different chemical characteristics, each one having different physical characteristics. And if you actually look, if you look at one example that's, that, that speaks to this process that I am providing as a theory, during aging, changes in skin that, are, that we associate with the, uh, the, um, the creation of this sort of aging form or phenotype, things like wrinkling, things like loss of elasticity, things like skin's inability to retain fluid, those are accompanied by a reduction in the diversity of proteins that reside in that tissue. And thank, thank goodness to my plastic surgery colleagues <coughs> who, although they'll tell you that they did this on purpose, I think that they stumbled upon it quite luckily. Um, in an attempt to use other fillers to augment skin contours in an attempt to provide a more youthful, youthful form, they began to say, well, you know, I'm doing a liposuction on this patient. Why not take some of that material and inject it into the face? And they found, wow, the results are really pretty good. That face looks really nice, even better than if I just injected collagen or some other filler. And it turns out that they found out that they were, uh, along with the adipose tissue, the liposuction material, they were also injecting stem cells, stem cells that were resident in that adipose tissue. And what happens is those stem cells get in there, they make the right proteins, and voila, you have sort of a renovation or rejuvenation of the skin. I think this happens in, can happen in every organ. We have evidence to say that recipients of bone marrow transplants from younger donors seem to take on more youthful characteristics. So I think there's a lot, a lot to this. I believe that aging is a stem cell problem related to a shift in the balance of undifferentiated versatile cells to differentiated specialized cells. Um, the reduction in the number of cells in your body that have the full transcribable genome has consequences, and that a reduction in the pro protein synthetic repertoire that is accessible also has, has uh, uh, physical and physiologic consequences. So I think the solution here is to recharge the regenerative engine by replenishing the reservoir of stem cells that can restore that synthetic versatility, and we can, in many cases, use that model to identify what the defective products are and then, res and then use, in some cases, things we, we can synthesize to restore organ and tissue functionality by just understanding what gets lost during the process of aging. The nice thing about this is that there are both autologous and allogeneic approaches to doing this. I can use an individual's, uh, individual's own cells as well as cells from a donor. And the solutions are at hand. We have taken stem cells from a placenta. We have pharmaceuticalized them. An illustration here in the, uh, in the upper left-hand corner is that in a vial, I can have high-quality living cells that can be injected either systemically, intravenously, or locally. And in addition to the myriad of biological activities they, that they perform to help control certain disease processes, um, I believe that they will ultimately find use in, in restoring functionality as we age. And I think that the future of stem cells and the future of cellular medicine can actually benefit from a new model describing functional similarities to computers. Your software, your biological software resides in the nucleus. It's no different than having a binary code that resides inside, inside the, 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 a the memory access part of a computer. The cytoplasm, the meat of the cell, is where the processing takes place. And remarkably, cell surface, the membrane of the cell, which is chock full of receptors and other molecules that interact with the environment, can be thought of as a keyboard. Okay, that is where events are transduced every time a cell sticks to another cell, every time a cell sticks to another, another uh, uh, basement membrane or matrix. And so if you think about this, this actually leads us to the concept that reprogramming the biological software of stem cells, which is already happening in activities to create induced pluripotent stem cells, 
does provide a platform for controlling fate and function, and I think it has broad biomedical applications. And the one that th is exciting to me is the ability to use these to prolong life, extend life, and extend quality of life. So with that, I want to thank you for your time and appreciate this audience.